Okay, hello everyone. I guess we can start now. And I guess you're already quite tired from the long day of sessions and I ho really hope you've enjoyed the conference. So, uh, first of all, just a sh few short words about me. I'm currently working as a software consultant. I'm one of the guys that organizes uh, the events of the Bulgarian Java User Group. We have our own conference as well, which we organize each year in May. I'm also an open JDK contributor. Um, I'm mostly interested in the Jigsaw project and the modularization of the Java platform. And I'm currently finishing a book on uh, the RabbitMQ message broker. So if you're interested also in uh, RabbitMQ, you can find me after this talk. So what's this talk about? Uh, we'll discuss what's the security architecture of the Java platform and basically what's the evolution of the security Java uh, model throughout the versions of the Java platform. Uh, after that, we'll cover the supporting APIs that are defined as part of the JDK standard library that support this security model. And at the end of the talk, we'll discuss several uh, best practices for applying this um, knowledge in order to write better applications and, of course, more secure applications. So, the evolution of the Java security model. Traditionally, companies have always tried to secure and protect their assets. They've deployed some systems such as intrusion protection systems, intrusion prevention systems, uh, they've deployed firewalls, they've configured antivirus systems in their, uh, in their networks, and so on and so forth. Uh, also, companies have tried to apply some strict security policies and network access policies, and they tried to make this uh, as formal as possible, so that, so that everyone in the company can, can follow them. However, with the introduction of various technologies, including applets, Java applets, a new range of security concerns uh, starts to rise in the Java platform. And this becomes more and more visible when the possibility to execute code from the browser uh, becomes not only a necessity, but uh, something from our daily life. So basically, the, the, the main goal of the Java security model or the Java security sandbox model is to allow untrusted code from applets to be executed in a trusted environment such as the user's browser. Once you run an applet in your browser, you typically have some uh, concerns regarding what does this applet do. Does this applet send some information to, to a remote system? Does this applet do something with my file system? And so on and so forth. So in regard to these concerns, the guy at Sun at that time decided to define a well-defined security model that would allow us to predict what could happen when we execute untrusted code from our browsers. And here, when it all starts, it's with uh, version 1.0 of the Java platform. Uh, this is when the original Java sandbox model gets defined. And in the, in the first version of the Java platform, we have a pretty simple security model. It says that basically all of the system source code in the JVM that runs in the browser is secure. It can do whatever it wants with the file system. It can write to the file system, open network sockets, and so on and so forth. And also, an all source code that's being loaded remotely from applets is untrusted. This means that only a particular strictly defined set of permissions is allowed upon applets. For example, applets were not allowed to write to the file system, they were not allowed to open a socket connection, and so on and so forth. This was the initial sandbox model defined in the first version of the Java platform. So code was executed uh, by the JVM, uh, and it was divided in two domains, trusted and untrusted and strict restrictions were applied to the untrusted one. As simple as that. Moving to version 1.1 of the Java platform, uh, the guys at Sun decided that uh, this model was quite strict and not very flexible for developers. So they, they introduced the notion of a signed applet. So uh, the signed applet actually allowed um, the applet to execute whatever it wants on the target system. Meaning that, for example, uh, when you sign an applet, you say, I trust this applet, and it has the same privileges as my system source code. So we can write to the file system, open a socket, and so on and so forth. So now uh, we have a little bit more fine-grained uh, access control that's being defined 
uh, in the applets of our system. This was in version 1.1. Um, so local code and signed applet code is now deemed as trusted and still we can have untrusted code coming from unsigned applets. And here is the basic process of applet signing which was introduced in version 1.1 of the Java platform. We compile the applet code, we create a jar file for the applet, then we generate a pair of public private keys uh, we also sign the applet with uh, the private key. Uh, we also export a certificate for the public key and optionally ver verify that certificate with a third party. This could be a certificate that's issued from a certificate authority, for example. Uh, after that, we import the certificate as a trusted one in our JVM and we create a policy file that uh, allows basically applets that are signed with that certificate to be uh, deemed as trusted. And at the end, of course, we load and run the applets. So this was the process of signing an applet, which is still valid uh, up to the current version of the JDK. And moving to uh, for towards version 1.2 of the Java platform, even more fine-grained access co control was introduced. And version 1.2 of the platform is uh, a major turn point into the Java security model. It is then when the notion of a security manager is introduced. So basically, the guys at Sun said that um, the initial model with trusted and untrusted source code is very limiting and it provides a lot of restrictions for developers and for applets. So they defined the notion of a security manager that allows you to specify permissions for your applet. So basically, the security manager works uh, with the notion of a code base. Each applet is loaded from a particular location uh, and when you load an applet, for example, this could be uh, voxdays.com slash demo applet, you can specify that all applets loaded from that location are allowed to do something with the system. Are you allowed to write to the file system, open a socket connection, and so on and so forth. Uh, there is a second API uh, which is introduced in the JDK platform as well, and this is the access controller API. Uh, the Access Controller API basically allows you to do the same thing as the Security Manager, but it's a newer API introduced in a subsequent version of the Java platform, as we shall see a little bit later. So this is now how does the security sandbox model look like. We have a security policy file. Each installation of the Java virtual machine has a security policy file that by default does not include the Security Manager. When you write your own Java application, it basically has all of the permissions uh, that you give it to it. So for example, when you write an application, you can open a socket, you can write to the file system. However, if you decide to install a security manager, and we'll see how this happens in a few slides, then your application may not have the privileges that are defined by the security policy file to do whatever you want to do, basically to open a socket connection and so on. So this is how things work. You say grant code base, then the location of where your applet is being loaded from. This, in this particular example, is voxdays.com slash demo applet. And you give it the permission to delete the C Windows folder. So you say permission, Java IO file permission. You have a, a lot of permission objects defined as part of the standard JDK library. Then you say the, the uh, object that you want that permission to target to. And at the end, the action. In this case, this is delete. So with this permission, you say that you're allowed to delete the C Windows folder. So the security model in version 1.2 becomes more code-centric. You basically define permissions based on the location of your source code. This could be a network location, or this could be your local file system. Additional access control decisions can be specified either in a security policy file or in a location that you have specified. So for example, this could not be a pure security dot policy file, but you can define your own policy, for example, to read permissions from a database or from another source. By default, this is a security policy file that's installed inside the uh, Java virtual machine. Uh, so you have no more the notion of trusted and untrusted code. Now you have already the ability to define permissions over a particular set of classes that are either in the file system or are coming from a jar file and so on. And 
and the notion of a protection domain is introduced in that sense. So the protection domain basically is uh, just a combination of the location of where your files are defined. defined. This is the code source or the location of the applet files and uh, the set of permissions that are assigned to that code location. For example, from let's say website abc.com, I can uh, load applets and they can do this, this and that with my uh, application. So, and also we have two types of protection domains, the system protection domain and the application. So still we have the notion of system and application code and the system code or the system protection domain basically uh, points to the location of all the JDK core library classes and the application protection domain uh, points to the location of the particular jar file as we saw previously. And the protection domain is set during class loading. Uh, when you actually retrieve an instance of a class, you can say uh, get class dot get protection domain in order to retrieve the information from where that class was loaded from. What is the location of that class? And basically you can also retrieve from that protection domain the set of permissions for that class. Uh, also, one interesting property of permissions is that they can imply each other. You can, for example, if you say that you have a file permission to delete the C Windows folder, this implies automatically that you can also delete the C Windows System32 folder. So you have to be careful when you define permissions. Uh, also, one location can imply another location. For example, if I say that I have permissions for all applets loaded from voxdays.com, this means that I have uh, the same permissions for all applets that are loaded from uh, uh, the website voxdays.com slash demo applet slash something. So the location of where my files and classes are loaded implies uh, other locations. So you should be careful also in that sense when you define permissions. Uh, also, since the execution thread or the current thread that executes the source code can pass through different class loaders, for example, this is the case with application servers when you have a WAR file uh, and the source code from the WAR file is executed in one thread, then that source code can invoke some services provided by the application server that are invoked in another thread. Then this means that the current executing code can pass through different class loaders. And in that sense, you may think, well, we have two different class loaders that load parts of our application. How do I define the permissions in that case? Since basically the class loader specifies the protection domain of the source, yeah, question? Oh, not. If, you, if we can check it. You can come closer here, there are places and you can... Oh. Yeah. Okay, so since actually the uh, execution of our source code can pass through multiple threads and basically the classes that are being invoked can be loaded from different class loaders, we have multiple protection domains, meaning that for, for the same executing source code we can have different set of permissions. And the way that the JVM deals with that problem is that it actually takes the intersection of the two protection domains. So let's say that, for example, I have a WAR file that's allowed uh, to write to the file system and open a socket connection. And uh, my WAR file uses some service from the application server that is uh, just allowed to write to the file system but not open a socket. Then the effective set of permissions that I have for my source code is that it is only allowed to write to the file system. I don't have the socket permission because one of the two protection domains does not have it. And of course the intersection of the two is just the set of permissions that matches in those domains. 
So this is how the JVM actually um, treats the protection domain. And basically moving uh, towards version 1.3 and 1.4, the security model of the Java platform stays the same. Uh, we have the notion of security model of an access controller that can be used along with the security uh, manager. So, however, we have one problem here. We don't have the notion of who is executing the source code. We can get the location of our classes using the protection domain. We can get the set of permissions that are defined on that location. But we cannot specify who is executing the source code or who is basically the user that uh, runs the application. In that sense, uh, something called JAS is introduced uh, in version 1.3 of the Java platform. Do you know what JAS is? Yes, exactly. So Java authorization, authentication and authorization service. So basically, JAS has two separate parts. Authentication, which defines who is the logged in user, and authentication. The authorization part of JAS actually uses uh, a pluggable authentication module that allows you to specify uh, in a JAS configuration what in what way you would authenticate your users. This could be either a database, an LDAP server, and so on and so forth. And basically, it's the um, authentication part that uh, extends the security policy file defined in the Java platform. So now, if we see a modified version of uh, our security.policy file, we say grant principle and I have the name of an LDAP entry which points to a user with name Tom. And that user is allowed to delete the C Windows folder. So basically a principle here is a property of the user that's being logged in. Uh, and in that case, as I'll see in a few slides, we'll see what are the components of JAS. Basically in that way, I'm saying that when a user logs in and that user has a name of Tom, in an LDAP server, then this user can delete the C Windows folder. And this is also a major improvement in the Java security model. Uh, so JAS extends the uh, Java security model with role-based permissions. Uh, and also, the protection domain of the class now contains not only the location of our classes and the set of permissions, but also can contain a list of principles or a list of attributes for the users in our system. This could be a username, an email address, and so on and so forth. All of these attributes are called principles. And also the authentication component of JAS is not specific for the Java security sandbox model. It's also used as part of Java E application servers to define uh, different types of permissions for our uh, J2E applications. And the authorization component is the one that extends the security policy as we saw earlier, here, this one. And here are the core classes of JAS. So we have a subject which represents our users in the system. And we have a login context that defines the objects basically that represent our users. So we have a login context. Out of that login context, we can have one or more login modules that specify the different modules that authenticate our users. This could be an LDAP login module, a file system login module, and so on and so forth. We can combine all of these modules, and we can provide multiple mechanisms for authenticating one user in uh, our application. Once we have authenticated the user, user using a particular login module, then we can create a subject instance out of that login module, which has one or more principal instances, which are actually the attributes of that user. Username, email address, and so on and so forth. So this is basically uh, the set of classes that uh, JAS provides, and which also extend the security sandbox model in the Java platform. Up to JDK 1.4, however, uh, we have the typical flow for permission checking so far. So once the system starts up, we can install a security manager. And by installing a security manager, I mean setting a security manager instance in the currently executing source code. We say system.setSecurityManager, and we set an instance of a security manager. For example, for executing applets in the browser, the JVM that runs in the browser installs a particular applet security manager. It says system.securityManager 
applet security, new instance of an applet security manager, and this uh, happens just before the applet is executed in the browser. Also, a security policy is set that is being uh, checked with that security manager, and it's set by means of calling policy.setPolicy. By default, the policy is defined in the file system in a security policy file, but it must be loaded. You can also specify a policy instance that loads your security policy from a different place. After we've installed a security manager, we load our classes, and some other things such as bytecode verification happen so that the bytecode verifier checks that your source code um, passes the, what's being defined in the Java specification. And also the current protection domain for the loaded class is set. So after bytecode verification passes, the location of your uh, loaded classes is being set in the protection domain along with the permissions that are being specified in the policy that you've set. After this happens, uh, you also have to invoke some uh, code. So basically when system code is, re uh, is invoked, uh, the security manager that we've installed in the first step is used to check that basically the, the current code that we execute has some permissions to do something. So in the entire code base, for example, of the uh, JDK libraries, you have system security manager dot check permission calls that check whether a certain thing can happen. For example, if you open a file out output stream in order to write some content to a file, the JVM has a security manager dot check permission call that checks whether the currently executing code has the permission to write to the file system. And so the security manager instance is used to check basically the uh, intersection of the protection domains based on the current set of executing threads and the currently executing call stack. And here is an example of a typical permission checking. Uh, you can find a lot of code like this in the code base of the Java platform. Or if you're writing an application server, you'll definitely need to specify in many places of the application server particular permissions for uh, your services. So you say socket permission equals new socket permission. You specify the location of that socket permission along with the port range. And then you specify the list of uh, available actions for that permission. This permission in particular says that I can open uh, and accept connections from the voxdays.com website from ports between 8,000 and 9,000. After that, I get an instance of the security manager that's being installed. And if I don't have a security manager installed, meaning that the security manager is null, then I just skip permission checking. And this is what's being done by default in the JDK platform. We don't have a security manager installed. Okay, and after this happens, basically, um, application code can also do permission checking using either an instance of a security manager if it's installed, or using directly the access controller class that provides a set of static methods for checking permissions. So the difference between an access controller instance and a security manager instance is that you don't have to install an access controller in your system you can use directly the APIs provided by the access controller class in terms of static methods that are defined in this class. Actually, newer versions of the Java platform use access controller as part of the security manager. So when you call this thing here, this actually invokes access controller dot check permission. So basically, the API is the same. And here is an example of this. You create the same socket permission and you say access controller dot check permission. So when you reach that point in your source code and if you are currently executing uh, source code does not have the privileges, then there is a security exception that's being raised. How this happens basically? When you reach the point when you call access controller dot check permission, all of the currently executing stack trace is checked whether each particular class in that stack trace has the permission to basically open a socket against this website, voxdays.com. If there is a single class in the stack trace that is not allowed to do this, then a security per, uh, exception is raised. 
So this is how basically uh, the, the sandbox model works. And five, if of course, of course, we uh, our application code can do permission checking with all permissions, or at least it needs to do it. We can call access controller dot do privileged. This means that we do not call, uh, we do not check the execution stack for any privileges. If we have a place in our source code when we say access controller dot do privileged and we specify some action, then we don't check the stack trace. We don't check whether our source code that has reached the point where we call access controller dot do privileged has any permissions to do whatever we need to check against. So basically, this is a privilege escalation in terms of the Java Se security sandbox model. Uh, an interesting thing of a custom security manager is uh, the one defined by the uh, Oracle database. For example, there we have a security manager that, for example, checks whether stored procedures written in the Java language uh, have some permission based on a database table. The permissions are defined in a database table and the security manager is customized to read the permissions not from the Java security policy file but rather from a relational database table. Reaching version 1.5 and 1.6 of the Java platform, there are the sandbox model is still the same. However, we have some new improvements, such as, for example, LDAP support for JAS, as we saw earlier. So this was introduced in version 1.6 of the Java platform. We can use an LDAP uh, login module as part of JAS, and a few other enhancements. Uh, moving towards version 1.7 and 1.8 of the Java platform, we also have some uh, minor improvements, such as, for example, we can also pass just a subset, for permission, subset of permissions to the do privileged method call. Uh, by default, when we call access per controller dot do privileged, this executes or elevates privileges of the currently executing source code to all privileges. But however, we can specify only a subset of uh, permissions that we want to pass to the do privileged method so that our elevated permissions are restricted. In version 1.9 that we expect from the Java platform, uh, we'll have project Jigsaw that will modularize the code base of the Java platform and will provide tools and mechanisms for the Java developers to develop modules in terms of the Java platform. So in that sense, in version 1.9 of the JDK platform, this the same security sandbox model will apply also for uh, Java modules. So we'll say, Module A has the permission to, for example, open a connection to that website or write to a directory in the file system. It's basically the same as what we have now with uh, Java applets. It will just apply in the same way with uh, Java modules. So by modules, we understand modules as they are defined by Jigsaw. However, uh, if, for example, you're using a modular system as OSGI, OSGI, for example, defines its own system class loader and its own uh, Java security manager. It's defined in the OSGI specification. And it says how basically uh, OSGI modules or bundles are checked for some particular permissions. Okay, so now let's see several interesting APIs that uh, basically contribute to the security sandbox model of the Java platform. So as you can see, the sandbox model is built into the JDK. Uh, however, the guys from uh, Sun have defined a lot of APIs that you can use along this security model. And um, these APIs are, as we can say, the second side of the coin. Here is a short list of the most important APIs that you have as part of the JK, JDK platform you have the so-called Java cryptography architecture that provides you with mechanisms to use various types of crypto cryptography algorithms, uh, message signing algorithms, and so on and so forth. You can also have utilities for defining your own public key infrastructure. You have a secure socket extension, which is just an extension of the standard Java sockets to, uh, for using SSL. We also have two interesting APIs, which are Java GSS API and Java SASL API or the simple authentication and security layer, which we'll cover very briefly. 
So the JCK uh, utilities actually provide mechanism for dig digital signatures, message digest, and so on and so forth. JCA uh, has a pluggable architecture. You can define your own algorithms for uh, encrypting your uh, parts of your application. Uh, also, JCA is independent uh, of any other algorithms. The JDK platform itself does not provide any particular implementations of uh, any cryptographic algorithms. You can, however, download uh, such a implementations and install them as part of your uh, Java virtual machine. Uh, also, the JDK utilities provide mechanisms to, for defining public key infrastructure of your own. Uh, this allows you to deal with certificates. You can create a public key infrastructure that issues certificates and optionally sells them or uh, gives them for free. Uh, you can also create uh, certificate revocation lists. This means that uh, you can specify what certificates are valid and what certificates are, certificates are not valid. Here is basically how uh, a certificate revocation check looks like. You have a certificate and you provide that certificate to the certification authority. And you can use either the OS OCSP protocol or a certificate revocation list to check whether that certificate is valid or not. These are just two alternative ways to specify to the certificate authority, hey, I have this certificate, please check whether it's valid or not. You can do this with the utilities provided by the JDK. Also, the secure socket extension, which provides you with the mechanism for creating uh, SSL sockets. And it's preferable if you write your applications to ever use SSL sockets and not, not pure Java sockets. Also, the Java GCC API, which provides an alternative mechanism of secure sockets, but it works by means of exchanging a secure context between the communicating parties. So we have a secure context that provides information between the client and the server, and it's an alternative to the uh, secure sockets in Java. You also have the SASL API, which allows you to exchange security information between the client and the server. The SASL API, basically, def uh, as defined in the JDK platform, allows you to say between the client and the server, hey, I want to use that mechanism for authentication. And in that sense, the client and the server negotiate the security mechanism that will be used. So for example, you can negotiate that the client will authenticate using an email address or using some other property which is defined in an LDAP server and so on and so forth. And of course, the SASL API also continues to evolve with the um, Java Security Sandbox model. There are many additions. In basically in the support for different types of protocols such as Kerberos and so on and so forth. Okay, and now let's see several best practices that you have to consider when you already know what the Java Security Sandbox model is. So typically, uh, if you attend the talk about security, you'll see mostly many things about input validation, error handling, type safety, so on and so forth. These are mostly not specific to the Java platform, but most of you should be aware of these practices. However, if we consider the Java platform, if you, for example, develop a Java library, you should always uh, consider respecting the security manager, meaning that you should provide your library with the ability to be installed and run as part of a managed environment, such as a Java application server, an OSGI container, and so on and so forth. For example, uh, in my practice, I had a use case when I wanted to use the JSON library provided by Google. So JSON is a very nice library that allows me to work with JSON to map it to Java classes or to generate JSON from Java classes. However, JSON was using um, the unsafe API and also a lot of reflection. And when I tried to use basically that library as part of an OSGI container, uh, then I got a security exception, telling me that basically I cannot use reflection due to the security manager restrictions that are implied in my OSGI container. So in that sense, the JSON library was not able to work out of the box uh, in a managed environment such as OSGI. So what we had to do, we had to just open up the source code of JSON and provide the necessary security manager dot check permission calls or access controller dot do privileged calls in order to elevate the permissions that we have. 
And after that, we recompiled the library and deployed it successfully as part of the OSGI container. So this might happen a lot in practice if you are dealing with third-party libraries. Also, you need to grant minimal set of permissions in your so uh, for your source code. I've seen uh, many developers actually granting all permissions. For example, you get a security exception, which you at least initially don't understand uh, why is it happening, and you just grant all permissions to the source code, which is quite bad. So basically, you have to grant minimal permissions to your code, and sometimes this requires a lot of analysis on what your source code is allowed and not allowed to do. Of course, copy-pasting may double the size of your security issues that you have in your source code. Also, in many uh, examples, for example, um, people just send the exception message to the application. For example, imagine a user of yours seeing a large stack trace. And if that user has some malicious intent, then he can derive some very useful information out of that st stack trace. So it's very advisable to always sanitize your messages and to restrict uh, what does the user see uh, as part of your error messages in your application. So that was it. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah? Um, I have a question. I have a library, and it's targeting Android phones as well. Yeah? I'm not exactly sure what's the situation with Dalit, but I think it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have a some APIs from JDK, and I think Security Manager could be one of them. I'm not quite sure about it. So my question is, how do you handle the situation where you need to run a, where you have a code which needs to run with uh, Security Manager and without Security Manager? Because all those do privilege calls, and so on have some sort of overhead. Yeah, yeah. So if we uh, go back to a few slides in the presentation, uh, if you remember, we had, for example, this example. We get an instance of a security manager, and if we have, if that instance is null, this means that we don't have a security manager installed. This means that we don't check for permissions. However, if we have an instance of that security manager, we invoke the check permission method that checks whether the currently executing source code has the permission to do something. So this is the way basically that most application servers and uh, other managed types of environments work. If you have a security manager installed, then you check for permissions. If you don't, you don't check. So maybe I could basically do some sort of static, uh, sorry, some uh, static uh, field, which will just check Boolean and if, uh, if the Boolean, yeah, I understand this. Yeah, yeah. You can bypass this, yeah? Uh, how do I write our own file, permission files? Uh, you, you, you can provide, you mean um, to create your own file and yeah. point to it. Well, by default, uh, the security policy file, if I, for example, open a Java installation on my, my system, um, let me go to Java, let's say, JDK 1.a, let me look for the exact location of a security policy file. I have a Java policy file in JRE slash lib slash security. If I open this, uh, you can see that I have some permissions by default, and these are, for example, java.security.all permission. Uh, however, this security policy file is not in place by default since I don't install a security manager when I write my application typically, unless I'm writing an application server. If, however, you don't want to use that location in order to specify uh, entries such as this, for example, property permission, this, for example, specify that um, I'm able to read the Java version property. My application is allowed to read the Java version property. And if I don't want to use this Java policy file and specify it in a different location, I can pass a parameter called uh, java.policy minus d.java.policy before actually starting up my JVM. And in that parameter, I can specify the location of my security policy file. Y yeah, question? Yeah. 
Uh, actually, there is a very good page, um, documentation page uh, in uh, the Oracle website. I can send you a link after the presentation, which defines a list of about 30 permission uh, classes, such as, for example, this one socket permission. Uh, and roughly speaking, what types of permissions do we have? We have permissions for whether we can use reflection or not, whether to access something from the file system, read or write, whether to open a socket, whether to create an instance of a security manager or to overwrite the instance of the policy file. Uh, we also have, what else, let me just think. We also have uh, permissions to read system properties uh, that are passed to uh, our application and a few others. Yeah, yeah question? Yeah. 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 For example, if I go back to a few slides uh, also in the presentation, for example, if let's say that you want to allow your application to delete the system 32 folder, uh, you can uh, simply specify java.io.file permission uh, star delete, meaning that you can delete all files of the system. And this is uh, not, very not a very restrictive type of permission. You want only to allow the application to delete the system32 folder, but you actually allow it to delete any file in the system. And this is very bad due to some obvious reasons. Yeah? Yes. Yes. Well, since we have uh, authentication defined in JDK 1.3 and still applies in uh, up to version J 1.9 and above, actually, if you have defined a just login module that uses the Kerberos protocol, of, this is the protocol that, for example, allows you to authenticate Windows users, and you use basically uh, the same users to define what per permissions do you have. Actually, you bind just to the users of your operating system. Then you, you are, if you are able to uh, elevate privileges on the operating system, then your Java application can do the same thing with the elevated user. Yes. Yeah. Okay, if no more questions, thank you for attending. <laughs>